am sorry. So um, these paintings were prevalent uh, or found their uh, zenith appreciation, you know, around the 16th to the 19th century. And the evolution of these paintings started way back from the 9th or the 10th centuries when Indian art moved away from the murals onto paper and suddenly finding the space uh, to be very small and constrained uh, in a paper, the artist had to move from, say, a three-dimensional quality where he could have a large cave wall where he could draw a mural into a very small linear artwork, which represented just the basic to convey a significance or a meaning to the artwork. So um, Ragnalam paintings actually moved away from something which is very... Um, which is very uh, three-dimensional to something which is very linear, small, stamp-sized. And uh, when you can look at the painting on the left, uh, you can see on the top, there is a kind of a notation or a couplet, which is written in Sanskrit. It also has a folio number on top, like it says number I1, not too sure. It has the top words in Sanskrit and a short, folio number written in Urdu and in the bottom of the couplet. And the painting itself consists of a white marble structure, which is in the middle of a lotus pond. And there are two characters who are probably involved in a kind of a prayer activity. And it's not just mere prayer. Uh, she seems to be having symbols musical symbols in her hand that she's playing. So the whole painting taken together conveys the meaning of the character involved in prayer singing, singing a hymn and uh, to the accompaniment of rhythmic uh, music that she's creating by using the symbols to keep her time and uh, her rhythm intact. But she seems to be very deeply involved in her activity. And that is actually um, a, a very good example of a Ragamala painting. This is a painting of Ragini Bhairavi. Um, and uh, I'm going to go to the YouTube presentation to speak about the Ragamala painting later, because I want to go through the slides first, introduce the idea and the concept before I show the YouTube. Uh, so the Ragamala paintings were actually created on paper. They were of miniature size and uh, they depicted a certain melody or the uh, melodic meter presentation. And the description for the painting was usually given on the top in, in a poetic, um, poetic uh, couplet. And um, the symbolism used in this is to just present all the elements that come together that the artist wants to convey in, 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 in bringing all the elements together, which includes uh, first the background to the centerpiece, the iconography of the figures, and also, uh, and also the, uh, the birds and the animals which are depicted because they add to the mood of the painting. And, the, and a description which is very crisp and very uh, precise in, the, in, in, uh, in, in uh, conveying the meaning of the painting. So they are usually created as a loose leaf folio and uh, the sheets are put together and they are made into a small set and presented uh, to the patron at the time of the painting. So this basic concept introduction of Ragamala paintings is that uh, they, they existed um, from the 9th to the 12th century as Jain manuscript paintings, evolved into their own name called Ragamala paintings from the 16th to the 19th centuries. And the greatest patrons of this uh, Ragamala paintings or the style of this painting were the Mughals 
because uh, uh, they enjoyed the process of uh, making brilliant paintings. The brilliance was added to give the uh, shine to the paintings and also uh, to, to make it portable and presentable to the patron, whoever it was. So usually the painting spoke greatly about the patron and when the patron received it, he was overjoyed at receiving uh, certain illustrations which spoke highly about his activities. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, it is very curious and I think it is a very, very Indian aspect that we like to ascribe uh, genders to musical melodies. And uh, why, why uh, even have this concept where you want to ascribe genders to it? So basically a melody was, was um, a raga consisted of five to seven notes, which the combination and the permutation of the notes brought about a certain feeling. So um, when you brought those notes together, there was a magical uh, thing happening, which conveyed a mood such as feeling very uh, somber or austere or just joyful or just plain playful. So all these was possible with just the permutation and combination of notes. So a raga is a mode or a structure of musical notes, but the melody is a combination of all these notes put together in a particular way. Uh, but when you have a raga, there are certain derivatives of those same notes when put together with a slight nuance, with a slight drop in the pitch of the same note that you will have a slightly lilting, uh, a slightly feminine, feminine version to the same raga. And therefore, these were called derivatives of the raga. And when they had the feminine qualities attributed to the melody, they were called ragini. In Sanskrit, anything with a ni added it gives it a feminine connotation. So raga and ragini. For example, you, uh, similarly, you can have a swami and a swamini. So anything added with the knee at the end usually gives a feminine um, attribute. So a ragini is a derived uh, raga, but with a slightly feminine intonation, connotation, and also uh, presentation. So it's presented in a softer way, and it is given a, it's given a, a feminine um, attribution in the sense that when, you, when the musician is singing it itself, his voice and his expression will show the slightly genteel side of the raga. So the raga ragini system appeared as a gender-based system for classifying melodic structures. But why did anyone want to do um, this kind of uh, classification, uh, partly because the musician, when he was rendering, he had to have in his mind's eye a set of ragas, as I mentioned, um, when he wanted to make a garland and he wanted to string certain melodies together, he had to decide which ones he wanted to string. So he, he had a choice of so many uh, ragas or raginis to choose from. So I think the classification helped as a, more like a memory, um, memory, um, like how we had mnemonics, something like that. So when you have a classification, you have a family of Radha Raginis. So in the earlier days, there were, there were very few Radha Raginis which were identified. So it was easy to classify a family of six, one male Radha, and five derivatives, which made a family of six. And there were six main ragas and five derivatives of each of the ragas, which made a total of 36 raga ragini set. And therefore, the illustrations also numbered usually typically 36 paintings. So um, 
while a raga might consist of nodes carrying an expression associated with strength, a ragini would derive uh, similar notes, but rendered with softness and gentleness. So um, the picture you see on the slide is actually one of uh, Deepak Raga, one of the 36 melodies for sonifying love um, from the Pahadi Hills. So this was one school of painting that developed after the Mughals, uh, uh, after the Mughal rule kind of declined and the artists had to find uh, different places or ateliers where they could continue with their work and find patrons. So moving on to the next slide. What is the essence of a musical melody? So there is a word in Sanskrit called rasa. Rasa actually means um, the, uh, the very essence in the sense like an elixir. It's, a, it's, a, it's supposed to be uh, everything concentrated. Like if you had a fragrance, then just a drop would be able to convey the whole, um, what do you call it, the smell and the, the sensory experience. So the ragas and raganis were also associated with certain condition emotion um, aspect. So when I say condition emotion, I mean there is a existing condition which results or which causes a certain kind of emotion or a reaction in, in, in a human person. And uh, this association is what was trying to be conveyed in a ragamala painting. So some condition emotion elements are better associated with, uh, say, uh, male uh, representation. For example, valor. If valor is a condition, then the emotion is enthusiasm. And if it is furor, then it's anger and so on. Similarly, in the feminine context, uh, I think the other uh, the other condition emotions would be, for example, humor. And so the condition would be love. And uh, let's say if she was um, uh, in a humorous mood, then you know, kind of mirth. But again, uh, very serious ones like that was on being separated from her lover. And so there is some amount of grief at. Uh, at the, at the condition that she is in. So these condition emotion is what uh, is being represented in a Ragamala painting, but uh, the over overriding or overarching theme of Ragamala paintings is usually love. And uh, when we say love, it means uh, the heroine and her condition and her uh, response to the various situations she finds herself in is usually the topic or the overriding theme. So almost all of the Ragamala paintings, you will have one motive which is running around. The main Raga is a male Raga and therefore you will have two characters, the male and the female being depicted in the painting. However, all the other derivative Raginis or the female derivatives of the Raga are shown with only the heroine in a condition and her uh, ways of coping with that condition or the emotion uh, that she wants to express. So the essence of a musical melody is basically just that, that rasa, you know, like it, you have to capture that quickly, like an arrested action. She's doing many things and you have to capture that in a second, something like a snapshot that we take nowadays so the illustrations are more like that. It's like um, uh, capturing that action while she is uh, un undergoing or doing certain activities that explain her mood. So the, uh, the painting is considered a success if the viewer is able to understand the emotion or the, um, or the action that the characters are undertaking. And uh, this, uh, this gives us a connect between the 
expression or the mood of a musical melody and its visualization. So when uh, the Met carried a exhibition in 2014 on Ragamala paintings, they called it picturing sound. So the picture on the left in the slide is basically just a part of their overview slide that they offered when they had this exhibition that ran, I think almost for about six months. And uh, the Met has a wonderful collection. So uh, they, they could actually have a series of uh, workshops explaining uh, the painting and the collections and the dates as well. I am moving on to the next one. Um, next slide, uh, it speaks. So we have made a connection between sound and illustration. But what exactly is in the illustration is a figure or a personified figure, especially of a heroine. And her action is what tells us what her condition is or what she's um, undergoing uh, in that moment. But when we draw or look at the figure, they seem to be very doll-like. There is very, uh, there is a plastic, um, plasticness to the placement of the figures. And also, unlike the Western uh, world where art means uh, giving great details in, in say a portrait or a painting, and there are so many aspects, even in a Western uh, painting, this uh, genre of Indian art takes away from the individual and takes the viewer's eye to the complete painting, the sum of all parts. You cannot be looking only at the figures. You will also be looking at the background. You will also be looking at uh, certain uh, angles. You will be looking at the fine detailing that is there in her dress. So a lot of information and uh, intricate details are given. However, the, the imagery is more important uh, in, in, in entirety, in all its elements, rather than looking at just the um, figure uh, of the person or the character. So here I want to speak about the figurative personification that um, um, the figurative rep uh, representation was some kind of iconography that they had to use and it had to be very appealing to the eye. And then when you want to make something very appealing to the eye, what you end up doing is uh, giving very fine clothes and uh, giving very fine, um, what do you say, uh, carpeting or anything which lays the foundation for the painting to show something very um, exquisite. So um, also when you look at the background, there are usually three parts to a painting. The top part is of course the couplet or the description. And immediately under that, you will find the reference to the season. So is it, is it summer, is it winter, is it rainy, is it monsoon or is it... Um, and apart from the season, you will also get a reference as to the time of the day. Is it early morning? So the colors chosen would be slightly pale orange, just like the rising sun and so on. So there are three parts to the painting itself. The top is a couplet, the middle, gives you the reference of the season and the time. And the bottom part is the placement. Where is this activity happening? It gives you great information about um, the activity that is happening. But um, again, a sense of perspective is given only in terms of size. They do understand uh, in these paintings that anything which is closer to you means the person uh, the, I mean, the person, uh, if the figure is slightly bigger, then the person is closer to you. If the figure is slightly smaller, then they are a little further away. So this concept of uh, perspective drawing exists um, in showing the size. 
So in this picture on your slide, you can see two women in the window. And uh, so they're drawn much smaller. They're supposed to be on at a height. And they are also speaking about the same thing. And it's almost as if, you know, she, the, the heroine who's depicted usually in red, uh, she seems to be saying, hey, watch out. It's going to pour <laughs> any time now. And uh, there is actually another figure at the back, almost behind a, uh, what you call a bamboo wheel or a curtain. And she also seems to be uh, looking out and saying, oh, yes. So this, this whole thing, this conversation that is happening is also depicted very quickly. And uh, the urgency of the uh, expression is conveyed to the viewer almost immediately. So there is no confusion and there is no interpretation as such. If there is an interpretation, it is only to understand um, what it is that the, uh, that the main character is, um, you know, kind of trying to say, but uh, in its, in its uh, understanding of the painting, there is absolutely no confusion. The artist is very clear in making us realize that uh, it is, first of all, in this painting especially, uh, it is, I think, monsoon. There are dark clouds, the birds are rushing, and they're trying to go back. And there's a little streak of lightning somewhere. And uh, when you look at the action uh, from the hands, that also conveys what it is that they are trying to either speak to each other or speak to the viewer. So no confusion. And um, like I said, you know, the, the figurative personification is a personification of the musical, what do you call the essence, expression. So we have already said there is an illustration, there is a connection with the sound. And now what we have made is that the characters and what they are trying to convey is also become very, very clear. So we have understanding of the raga which is which represents um, the essence, which is like um, here it seems to be Megra. Meg is uh, Meg means cloud, and the name of the rag itself is Meg. It's connected with the season of monsoon, and uh, the characters are busy about to rush inside and take shelter from the thundering rain, which threatens to uh, pour in any moment. So very clear in its me meaning, no confusion about that. And the theme of the Ragamala is the condition emotion. Like I said, the essence has to be there. So there is a hero and a heroine. And uh, again, in this painting, there is no question as to who the heroine is. Although there are four full characters in the picture, the lady in red, no, no two question. She's the main character and she is shown with great detail and also uh, the action or the position of her hands conveys what she wants to say. So um, yeah, going back to the literary couplet description, I, for example, I'm taking this exam, uh, the same picture that was introduced in the first slide about uh, Ragini Bhairavi, where she is in performing prayers and singing a hymn. So uh, when you look at this, the description also, when you look at the words, it is, uh, I'm going to say it in Sanskrit and not many people will understand, but please uh, don't mind. Uh, I'm just going to read out the keywords uh, for the people who do understand. So it is Sarovar Astha. Sarovar means uh, a pond. Yeah, so, and it is uh, Sphatika Mandape, white marble, yeah. And so there is already within the first two words, what is described is there is a lotus pond and there is a marble temple structure in, in the lotus pond. So, um, and she sits, 
So the description states that Ragini Bhairavi is depicted as sitting on a white structure or a temple structure in the middle of a pond. Uh, the word here is clanging. When she puts two, uh, the two pieces of the symbols together, there is a noise, there is a clang. So the word for it is clanging and she's singing hymns. So uh, everything described in the two lines. And then, like I said, there's no confusion, though, there's no interpretation. We know what the painting is. And the name of the Raga Ragini is definitely mentioned. The, the description, the physical description is given and also the activity or the mood which is conveyed is also mentioned. Everything mentioned in the two, two line, it's a two liner <laughs> that gives everything. So that's amazing um, composition. You know, like it's not uh, like how um, artists like us just put, you know, when we finish a painting and we are looking to title it and all we say is a girl in the whatever, or it's just a few words. And the viewer is left to interpret uh, many things out of that painting. I mean, the viewer will bring your attention to a few things, but it is subject to a lot of interpretation. Not so Ragmala paintings. There is no, uh, uh, it's very clearly mentioned what it is that you should be understanding from this painting. So when they, when they, when they had to write this verse or the couplet, how did they do it? What uh, gave them the criteria to compose in such a way? So, uh, you know, very often they say that uh, meditating or dhyana is the way to uh, think like, okay, what is the description? What am I trying to put? But when you put it in this couplet, it's more like a formula. It's, um, it's a code. So you have a rhythm, a meter, Sanskrit language itself, um, offers itself for this kind of very concise concept, combination and shortening of words when they meet, come together so that the meet, meaning is conveyed in a particular rhythm, a meter and ends perfectly well. So this is more like a, so if he, if he was not a visual artist, a musician would actually imagine similar picture in his mind and therefore, uh, the couplet is putting in words what an artist uh, thinks in abstract. So here you have an abstract thing like the essence of a melody be, being pictured as, as, a, as a sound that can be illustrated. And therefore, the beauty of Ragamala paintings is that um, you wonder at the artist because not only was he doing the art, the painting, the sketching and everything, he was also looking at a good description and he was also understanding uh, the musical composition. So moving on to the next slide. So as I mentioned before, uh, when I speak of genesis of Ragamala painting, you can't say oh, it started only at this point in history or at that point in history. I think it's more like an evolution. And like I mentioned, the first known illustrated scripts, uh, uh, illustrated uh, texts was where uh, paintings in Indian art in the miniatures started. So we had something called the Jain texts and they would typically uh, be made either on bark leaves before, uh, before the uh, before paper was introduced, before the introduction of paper, and very surprisingly, the paper and introduction happened only around the 12th century. So between the 9th and the 12th, when the Jain painting had to be made into manuscripts, they were usually done on bark sheets or treated and processed bark sheets, and therefore the uh, the person who wrote the script or a text would leave a little stamp sized corner of a page for the artist or the illustrator to add on an image later. 
So there was usually no direct connection between what was written on that sheet and that page and the picture. The picture was more about the entire story which was being conveyed in a text. But uh, from then on, I think because it was stamp size and it was small, the features became very linear and therefore the, the usually you would find um, the figure uh, only in only on the side. You would see only the side profile. Very rarely you see a full frontal profile. And uh, the most important thing which, uh, which evolved is, uh, I would like you to draw your attention, is the way the eye is drawn. It usually starts from somewhere near the nose and ends, I think, behind the ear, as <laughs> I'm not too sure. But they are massive, big eyes. And uh, those eyes are, uh, they were first started uh, during the Jain paintings because they wanted everything to pass through the mind's eye. That was the word, the mind's eye. And therefore, the eye was considered extremely important and became the most important feature of the face and its drawing. This huge eye remained, uh, remained in Indian art right until um, Jamini Roy, when he wanted to have paintings that uh, depicted Indian folk art. So it, it moved from uh, Jain paintings into Ragamala paintings, into Mughal court paintings, into all the other schools, but the eye remained an important part and it has remained the same. And it becomes actually one kind of very symbolic representation of uh, Indian art. So uh, until, uh, until the 12th century, we had the Jain paintings, but after that, around the 11th century, again, historically, uh, the Turkish sultans, they, sort of occupied India, but they, they wanted to assimilate their music, their dance. They also wanted to learn what was existing in the Indian um, subcontinent. And therefore there was a new sense of music and with new sense of music and uh, combined influences, there were new ragas uh, that were created, that were good. And um, this is a very important uh, transition in the north of India, because of all the invasions and especially the Persian influence, there were new musical instruments, there were new ragas, and also uh, what you would call, you know, a new uh, coinage of terms uh, describing the ragas. So uh, one prominent personality during the Turkish invasion was uh, Amir Khusro, and he's, uh, accredited with uh, creating many new ragas, which had a lot of Persian influence. And uh, even the in Indian instrument sitar was acting introduced by him. So there were a lot of changes around the 12th century with the Turkish invasion. And with that, the north of India moved on to something which today we call as the Hindustani genre of classical music. Whereas the rest of the south of India did not have too much of this assimilation uh, or uh, fusion of music. And therefore it remained in some sense um, what was uh, existing earlier. Not to say that there were no influences, I'm sure there were influences, but uh, Hindustani became a different style and a genre on its own. So that then from then onwards, we had the north-south divide in the classical music uh, of uh, the Indian subcontinent. Um, immediately after the Turkish invasion, we had the Mughal invasion. <laughs> so that was again, another major influence, may not have been purely on music, but definitely on the visual art. So the new technique of burnishing, which means polishing uh, with the stone to give it a shine and using gemstones um, to add brilliance to the paintings is something uh, the Mughals brought in. And uh, 
I will move on to the next uh, slide um, because I'm speaking about materials. Um, I will first speak about the stones uh, and the paints, the pigments, and then move on to the paper, though in my slide it's the other way around. Um, crushed mineral stones, vegetable dyes, oxides, metals. These were greatly used uh, to make the painting. The paintings are usually um, ground together. The pigment is uh, mixed with gum arabic and they usually put it in shells like these. The reason they put in shells is we do not want, because they are, many of them are oxides and many of them have mercury in them. We do not want any other disastrous chemical reactions happening um, when we are just making the paint and therefore they would put it on shells and shells uh, afford uh, contain our containers that, uh, that, that leave the pigment as it is without further um, chemical reactions happening. So there's no further oxidization happening. There's no further um, deterioration in the fading in the quality or the color of the uh, paints. And um, I just want to tell you one thing, you know how the word uh, miniature uh, came about and uh, it all, it's all because of this uh, red oxide powder, which is called minium. So I just want you to uh, bring your attention to this sentence. Minium, an oxide of red lead, was easy to make and less expensive than cinnabar, and hence it became the most commonly used red for coloring. And the Latin word for minia, it was miniare, meaning to make the minium paint was called miniare, and the person who made the pigment was called a miniator. And therefore the words or the art which used this pigment were called miniatures. And uh, I mean, we like to associate uh, miniature and mini with just, we have never actually understood where the word came from. And we just assume miniature is very tiny, but uh, it's actually connected to a pigment. And that is something very, very rare, but you will find information like this and um, intriguing tidbits uh, in almost all the uh, exhibitions worldwide. So. Definitely, um, this is something when I read it the first time, I was like, hmm, really? <laughs> I didn't know about this. I just assumed everything was a miniature, but I never understood that minium as a color was the root or the etymology for the word miniature. One other pigment that is very, very interesting, I'm sure almost all of us know is about lapis lazuli, the blue pigment. And uh, when I tell my students, you know, that the reason uh, that blue is called royal blue is because only the royals could afford that blue for something uh, they were like, really? Uh, but that's true. It was called ultramarine because it had to be shipped as a stone across the seas and carried and it was worth its weight. And therefore, when you crush a big stone, you get maybe this much of pigment and therefore to make a full royal garment, whether it's for the church or for the, any personality, royal personality, you would need a lot of pigment. And for that pigment, you had to get a special permission from the government to be able to import that stone. So another interesting tidbit. But the most important uh, reflection of the, uh, the, the Mughal, uh, contribution to Ragamala paintings and the brilliance, as I mentioned, was the use of gold and silver leaf, which was previously um, not uh, being extensively used. Again, similarly, um, it never, it, it, was, it was very expensive, first of all, to have the gold and the leaf ready for usage. And secondly, to be able to process the stone or the, the gold or the silver into a powdered pigment or even a loose leaf. 
the process was very, very tedious. And so uh, if something was sold in already a loose leaf form, then it was already so much more expensive. But gold leaf and silver work to add to the brilliance along with burnishing is a purely Mughal, um, what do you say, contribution to Indian art. Um, the second most important thing, I think, in terms of uh, the Mughals uh, bringing out uh, uh, Indian art on, the most important thing is they introduced paper extensively. Uh, till then, paper was actually, um, I think it used to come from Afghanistan. And uh, when it was, it had to come all the way from the Western, uh, Western region of India. And therefore, those areas, or even the port areas, were definitely the first places where all these materials were received. But their storage and distribution was another matter altogether. And therefore, for the storage and the distribution, the entire Mughal uh, network and a series of permissions at every region uh, played an important part in receiving. And therefore, when the um, when the ruler, the Mughal uh, ruler, wanted the painting to be commissioned, he would give permission for the atelier for the supply of all painting materials, including paper. So until then, you know, like uh, before paper, um, they did try on parchment. So the difference between parchment and paper, or even paper is that parchment is animal skin is not paper parchment paper was a paper that resembled its thinness or its transparency of an animal skin so which is why the word parchment paper came about but otherwise uh, in india there were uh, tree barks which were used and later uh, parchment, which is very thin animal skin, which was used in, you know, making the musical instruments. The percussion instruments also use a lot of leather and skin, animal skin to create the musical instrument. And the leftover from that was processed and used to make illustrations and paintings. So paper was, I think, introduced by the Mughal in ex extensively, and therefore it suddenly became very available. The word for that kind of handmade paper is called vasli. The word vasil in Urdu actually means um, attached together. So a series of sheets attached together to give a tensile strength, which will not crack upon, you know, receiving um, the pigment or the, the, the color is what uh, the artist would aim for. So if somebody commissioned a painting, I think the work, work to create the materials for the painting started almost about six to eight months or even a year before the artist actually sat down to sketch and paint. So on this slide, you can see on the right, the, payment, uh, the paper on the right called Vasli. It looks a little creamish because this is how paper, when it dried, uh, this, this is a, they call it the Kora color, which is without, uh, like how you say, acid-free paper. It doesn't react to acid. So they, it's processed in a certain way so that uh, this paper absorbs maximum particles of the pigment. Now, again, very interesting tidbit. Uh, I hope I'm not overshooting, but this is a very interesting part. So how do you know what is the difference between say gouache, watercolor, and all these water-based mediums? It's the size of the particles that you crush the pigment into. So watercolors have extremely fine crushed powders, whereas gouache has slightly thicker particles. Does it make a difference? Of course, because when you have thicker particles, they refract and reflect light differently. When you have watercolor, very fine particles that stick to the surface, they reflect light differently. So uh, the finer the particles, the more uh, flatter the painting, 
the thicker the particles, more, what do you call it, varied, uh, varied reflections. Like the same pigment looks dark at one place and slowly fading into something light. That happens because the pigments are not, I mean, the particles are not even or the light that falls on that surface is not even. So you get a varied uh, sense. So uh, the amount of um, pulsing or the, what do you call the grinding you do to the particles also makes a huge difference. And this was also taught in the ateliers. So you were taught to make your own paper and make it, um, what do you call, bug free. And you're supposed to make your pigments and keep them ready. And only then were you ready to start the artwork. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, every Ragamala painting has three parts to it. And uh, apart from the top part, which has a couplet, the second immediately tells you the season. And uh, once you see the season, you also know the time of the day. So there was an association of a particular raga with the season. There are six seasons in India and there are six main raga raginis in India. And we have one set associated with each season. The reason we experience season is because different parts of the earth face the sun and therefore you get that kind of summer is really hot and winter is cold. And, but the seasons play an important role in our dispositions like uh, um, a very dull day that ends at 3 p.m. and it gets dark. There's very little uh, joy after that time for us to, um, you feel like winding down very quickly <laughs> rather than having a very long day where you have 12 hours of sunshine, 12 hours of nighttime, you get a lot done. It's very productive. So the seasons change, therefore our moods change, our productivity changes. Also another important aspect is why do we have Indian music that connects also with the time of the day? Uh, the reason being the same thing, because, because the, the, the music enhances what you are already experiencing. Uh, to put it in a very simplistic way, if you are winding, I mean, you have come back after a very long day, you would like mellow music that helps you unwind. If I start putting gym music at that time, you are going to resist with a great uh, protest. So that's exactly the thing. Whereas if I put a very mellow uh, winding down music, you say, wow, what beautiful music. So again, if you were in the gym and you were trying to do a treadmill and I put something very slow, you would say, my God, I'm never going to get this done. You want something to pep you up. So the music connects not only um, with what uh, the season is, but also the time of the day. What is it that activity, what is the body clock telling you to do? So it connects with that. But again, time and rhythm, they're automatic. They connect in an overarching way with your pace of the day. So seasons, time, everything plays an important and Indian uh, music and Indian painting. Take cognizance of the fact that the human body is greatly connected with other factors, uh, such as season, time of the day, mood, and uh, food <laughs> as well. So they take cognizance of all these factors that make your, uh, make your day better in some ways. So I'm just going to give you a small connection between the season and the raga. Uh, not to memorize or anything, but it's pretty evident from the names is what I'm trying to point out over here. For example, spring is connected with rag vasant. The word vasant in Sanskrit actually means spring. So it's literal translation, spring, wasn't. Uh, Bhaira for summer, the summer month, uh, summer season is called Grishma. The word Grishma in Sanskrit refers to heat. Great amount of heat. So uh, the Rag Bhaira is supposed to um, bring out, you know, the very, 
I mean, if you're in, if you're in um, a very great uh, amount of uh, energy sapping heat, you would be very, very, uh, what do you call, very, very, um, you wouldn't be very joyful, playful, you would be very, very flat, you would be very deep. And like, uh, le uh, let's just assume it's the afternoon and it's very hot. You don't want to go out, you don't want to do anything uh, very active. You just want to be placid. So something like that. And the uh, monsoon is Varsha, literally the same word in Sanskrit. Uh, autumn, uh, the rag, Shri, and the word Shri again means auspiciousness or abundance. And uh, we have another season called pre-winter or early winter, which is called Hemant. The Sanskrit word Hemant actually can be, uh, it's, a, it's a coined word. I mean, it's a, it's a word which has two parts to it. Hema and Anta. So Hema is something golden and Anta is end. So the end to the golden time and the start of winter. So that's how the word pre-winter is, like it's moving into deep winter. And of course, the last is winter season for Shishir and the rag is Malkons, which is a very, very deep spiritual raga where you connect not only with nocturnal spirits, but uh, uh, otherworldly spirits. So this is a connection between the six ragas and the six seasons. And uh, usually the seasons are very clearly depicted. And here the description says, Megh Malhar. If you see the words in Sanskrit, it says Megh Malhar, that is the raga. And uh, the person is actually uh, dancing in the rain, literally. So that's what. So moving on to the, I have told you so much about Ragamala paintings that it becomes so difficult now to understand, okay, how do I recognize one? Or what are the main things that I should look for in a painting? So the paintings were meant to be portable, number one point, in the sense that they were to be viewed at the leisure of viewers. So they were never hung on walls. They are never exhibited, displayed, or uh, put on walls and museum exhibitions. They are usually like a folio. Um, the painting uh, that I've put in the slide is from a sheet of Akbar Nama. So you can see this artist Abu Fazal presenting his folio of paintings to Akbar. The size, and uh, I'm just going to move my cursor there. So this is his book of folios which he is presenting. So um, the paintings were often created at the rich, uh, behest of rich patrons. So they had brilliance of gold and silver. And so therefore they were called court paintings. And uh, how do you know? There is a set of about 36 paintings from one folio. They would usually be numbered. Um, they, you will not find uh, the name of the artist, but uh, very rarely, you would find the name of the school or the atelier with the senior teacher's name uh, inscribed somewhere in the painting. Uh, the paintings have figures drawn in a very linear, like I said, in profile, very plastic. It'll have a hero and a heroine in an activity conversation. And, uh, um, and the, like I said, there is no mistaking the import of that painting. It's very clear. The description gives it, the activity gives it away, and uh, the mood is set by the season or the day of time depicted. Sorry and, to interrupt, Kumuda. Uh, we are at 12 o'clock right now. Okay. So we we'll need to wrap up the session a bit soon. Yes, yeah. thank you. Just two more. I'm sorry to have digressed a little bit. <laughs> All right, and uh, there are certain symbols such as animals and birds, the flora and the fauna in a painting. And uh, the colors correspond to the raga, but the red color, which I said, the red leg, is always present in some form or the other. And uh, the best collections, as I said, are available worldwide. The, one of the... Um, 
largest collections is with Cornell University. And uh, the Met did actually an exhibition and an overview in 2014 that lasted a few months. The British Museum, Smithsonian, uh, Victoria and Albert, these are just to name a few. But uh, I just want to point out that you will find some folio or a painting in every museum of the world because they were sold not as the whole set, but as singles loose leaf. So each museum acquired a piece either through an auction or through a sale by any of the royal patrons, we have no idea, but nowhere do you find uh, the full set together. And in India, the best collections are in this new museum called Museum of Art and Photography in Bengaluru, the Salarjan Museum, which is the Deccan paintings, and of course, National Museum of Delhi. So I'm just going to conclude. Ragamala paintings were an important genre. I hope I brought out what the paintings were about, where they tried to illustrate music, um, a musical melody, and they had a poetic description to it. The figures were personified and they were personifying something, uh, something abstract. So it is actually in terms of bringing something abstract onto your paper and making it into a miniature. The challenge in itself, but beautifully met and uh, you know, created uh, by uh, the artists in India from the 16th to the 19th century. But um, after the decline of the Mughals, I think the patrons were few and far in between and slowly just died. And today, I don't think uh, people have too much interest in Ragamala paintings either in um, creating or recreating uh, that kind of art because Indian art has moved on from there. And uh, there are so many aspects to Indian art that borrows from the Ragamala paintings, but, um, uh, but have evolved to adapt to the regional needs uh, in India. Thank you very much. Uh, I think with that, I want to conclude. I hope uh, I have brought this beautiful genre um, in front of your eyes, which is what I wanted to do because I want to bring an awareness and appreciation for this genre. Mm. Thank you very much, Kumuda, for this um, presentation on the classical art of Ragamala paintings. Uh, so even though we're running over time, I'd just like to throw it out there in case anyone has any burning questions about um, the presentation. Would you like to maybe either speak up or type a question in the chat box? All right, so if... Yes, so, the, um, so we have a compliment for you, um, Kumuda. You can read it in the chat box um, from Minnie and Abba that uh, it was a pleasure listening to your talk. Indeed, it was very interesting. So now with that, then maybe I'll just bring the session to a close by sharing uh, what our next MML will be next Monday. So if you're interested, uh, if you've ever wondered what, what the connection is between the Singapore Botanic Gardens and um, Tan Tok Seng, the famous Singapore philanthropist, next week's talk is going to be just about that. So it will be presented by um, uh, Ms. Ratika Shah Singh. And uh, the title of the talk is Pioneering Rubber and Orchid Plant uh, Cult Cultivation in Singapore, a Legacy of the Singapore Botanic Gardens and the Tan Tok Seng family. And it's in two weeks time, right, Yenpi? Yes, it is. Uh, That's right. Oh, my apologies. It's, uh, in, it's in two weeks time, but keep a look out on our website so you'll know, uh, you, you'll always uh, be up to date and keep a look out on our website. And also, if you're free this Friday, do join us at the ACM for Friday with Friends, where you'll get to hear um, from Ms. Abba Kaul on the Pancha Tantra, which is a, a very popular topic she presented quite recently, um, that is about the fables of ancient India. So that'll be 7 p.m. at the ACM if you're free. And so with that, we'll see you again at the next Monday lecture. And thank you, Kumuda, once again. And have a great week, everyone. Bye. Thank you.